doing one of these again. We're nearly at the end of some of these. Like you can see we got only a few like five, three, done, three, five, four, I can do maths. A fuck ton. <laughs> Quite a few. And yeah, like yeah, these ones. So we should really be focusing on these because these are like it's a time trial and I can't do it because I'm a baby. So it's like um you know, all the AI proved too smart for me. So we're gonna... <laughs> and we'll just deal with the, the trash afterwards. Uh, as in, I'm trash. Ah. Uh, Grand Prix, you say? Everyone used to take the piss out of me when I was like, three. Because I, I saw the Grand Prix on TV and I was like, oh, the Grand Prix. And hey, tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> like the Formula One Grand Prix. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for being so woke so early to it's basically just rich bastards blowing money away. That that old phrase, man. The old phrase. How do you make a small fortune in motorsport? Start with a large fortune. Uh, today, I am going to be talking pretty much entirely about metal that I recommend people to listen to and what I would call gateway bands into heavy metal as everyone kind of calls it, even though by my standards it's like, this is just hard rock, really? I listen to this for, like, a palate cleanser, because I'm that cool now. I'm so hardcore, guys. I listen to Norwegian death metal <laughs> as a palate now. No one does that. <laughs> okay. Not meaning to be a twat. I love those bands. I will always go back to Metallica, Motorhead, um, Iron Maiden. I'm a hardcore fan of those bands. Hardcore fan of Megadeth. Gonna always Pantera. Just gonna listen to that shit and it's just gonna be stuff I have playing in the background. It's what makes me comfortable. And most people are like, eh, it's too heavy. Stop being a baby. It's literally like it's the easiest it's ever gonna get for you. Oh, I said easiest. Like, Avenged Sevenfold is probably easy. Let's talk about my life in metal. When I was first listening to music, it was just goth and uh, goth alternative and uh, glam rock that my parents had left around because they, yeah, <laughs> used to listen to that stuff and then had forgotten that their sick roots and then become lame because, you know, adulting. Uh, and they're kind of of that era where they were told, you have your fun and then you go home. You know, they're the kind of generation where they were just told, hey man, you can't wear a hat at the table, it's rude. Don't put your elbows on the table, it's rude. And they never thought to question that the logic of this and why it's rude. They just believed all of the old wives' tales, the tradition, the bullshit, and went, oh, it must be something to do with like ridiculous politeness, so no reason to question it, and whether or not it's even valid. And this is considered the rebellion era, so it's kind of like rebellion, but without the intelligence to question basic thing. Anyway, I'm getting off of context. Um, now, why the fuck do we do this? Because it seems completely pointless and inefficient, and actually harmful to the environment. And like, also, who the fuck cares that much? The world is exploding. Why do we care if I'm wearing a fucking hat at the dinner table, or if I casually swear? My parents used to flinch so fucking crazy when I used to just say shit like, but I just swear and I just throw bombs out there like it's nothing. Obviously not at work because I'm a fucking teacher and I was <laughs> she said a fucking teacher. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm a teacher. It's casual to me. I don't do it because I'm trying to be cool and edgy like a teen or something. I just do it because it's like my cadence. 
although it sounds ridiculous because I have a really, like, posh-ish British accent, so it's like, oh, well, fucking, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, my parents used to let me play violent video games in front of children that, you know, like my sister and her friends, who were, like, seven at the time, and it was the fact that some of those uh, the soldiers that were your, like, buddy partners in Gears of War, every other word is like, what the fuck, oh, the fuck, oh, shitload, oh, fuck. And that was the problem. It's like, the brutal murder, though, that's acceptable, right? I'm chainsawing fuckers in half. <laughs> nope, okay. Blowing people to bits. That's fine. Just don't show extreme fucking, you know, swearing is rude. I've had this conversation before, but some of my uh, friends have called me out and said, I say, in very like, Ugh, I don't like it that you say these words, because I referred, like, I'm a, I'm a sound engineer at the university, that was my, that's what my major's in, and uh, I referred to a piece of tech that was breaking down all day and making, creating electrical noise in the feed and making, like, you just have to re-record takes for like a track for an album. Uh, I was referring to it as being a bit cunty and he got really offended and I was like, dude, you working in the music industry and you're offended by someone referring to something as being a bit cunty. <laughs> it's like, trust me, dude, if you start working with some of these bands, you're going to see and hear a lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone gets offended, like, I always, I find language fascinating. I mean, I'll get to the metal at some point. I find language fascinating, it's literally like what I do as a job, and I like studying language and the development thereof, and how children and young babies acquire language early as acquiring it through the mother's stomach in the womb. It's really interesting to see how the brain develops when exposed to certain sounds, and, like, you know, all of that stuff. It's very interesting. Acquisition of language is fascinating because we're one of the, well, we're pretty much the only species on the planet that actually has that to any level. Some have rudimentary communicative skill with each other, but they're not creating entire language. Just like clicks or like pops or signals or something like that, you know, uh, certain noises that communicate to a degree. So it's really interesting. And what I found really interesting is swearing through languages really indicates what that culture is most afraid and offended of. In British language, virtually every highly offensive swear word is to do with sex or the female genitalia specifically. Like calling someone a prick is not offensive. A dick, not offensive. A cock, a little bit offensive. There's no deeply offensive word for penis. But the worst one goes to the vagina, and it really suggests quite a lot, like of like impact, you know, because it's a crude, vulgar word for vagina, and like our other favorite one, fuck, is obviously about sex, the act of sex, and like the fact that like our entire culture, the most primal curse fear, curse word fears, are sexual in nature is quite interesting because you know it's completely different language and culture to language and culture. Like, um, in China, the most offensive words you can say is to essentially say, I want you to die. Death. I want you to die and I want your family to die. These are more offensive. And one of the most vulgar words is, it's mostly calling people incompetent. Calling someone a cunt in their language is kind of rude, but not at the same level as it is to us. Calling someone a different word, which literally translates into, you stupid incompetent cunt, or you, you stupid cunt, is considered way more offensive because you're suggesting that they can't do something. And like their entire culture is a like, when you see the way their pride system works and stuff, they don't like being told they're stupid at a much higher level than we do. We get offended when people say, you can't do this, you're stupid, or like, say you're a dumbass or call you a moron, but it's not at the level that they like. 
they like straight up will refuse to answer questions they don't know the answer to or redirect the topic because they can't admit that they just straight up don't know a thing. Even if it's very obvious that they don't know the thing, it's like, you can just say you don't know. They can't. <laughs> they find it really, like, difficult. Uh, you know, it's just... And wishing death, they are terrified of death. In our language, you're like, you shouldn't be taking this down, it's bad luck, it could be a curse or, like, a, you know, symbol of death, you shouldn't be doing that. And they'll freak out if you say it. Don't say that! Don't say that! And you're like, you shouldn't have taken the Christmas tree down early. <laughs> One of my kindergarten teachers I was working with freaked out and shouted at me because I said to her, you shouldn't have taken that Christmas tree down early. You're supposed to take it down in January. If you leave it, you take it down straight after Christmas, it will be really bad luck for the next year because that's, people don't know that, but that is the superstition of Christmas. And she says, don't say that, don't say that. Oh, I'm so worried now. What if my baby falls ill and all of this stuff? That she took it really seriously. And I was like, dude, it's just, you know, we casually say it's bad luck. Shouldn't do that. But she's like, no, 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 don't say that. Don't say that. Oh, oh, no. Oh. And I'm thinking, like, dude, it's, it's a joke. But to them, luck is a tangible, more tangible thing that is real. Fortune is important. So, like, death, bad luck, illness... They're terrified of these things, even though they're the natural parts of like being alive. It's the you know, it's the sine wave that is life. You're going up and down. Sometimes you get good luck. Sometimes you get bad luck. Sometimes you get good pay. Sometimes you lose your job. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, um, you know, everyone goes through ups and downs, and you just gotta take it. And it's a learning circle. They hate failure. They hate failing and not being first place in everything. They hate. They're highly competitive as a result, and all of their curse words show that. The worst thing you can say to a, um, most people, we, uh, most worst thing you can say to people that's not gender specific is die, uh, or fuck off and die, or something like that, or you're incompetent. The next worst thing that you can say is gender specific. If you call a woman a slut, you know you might say it's casually, almost as a joke in our country now. Where you're like, oh, she's a bit of a slut. <laughs> like you know, over here they're like. You're befouling this person's name, and it's like slander. They because they take their like chastity and virginity and stuff really seriously, or kind of. But they don't like people suggesting that they're sluts, even if they are. <laughs> and they, you know, not in a slanderous. Oh, you're such a slut. Oh, fuck you. Obviously, that's rude. You don't just say that and throw that out there anyway. It's kind of nasty and unnecessary. But like. Um, in their culture, it's really offensive to say to women, like, really offensive. I've heard of people getting really funny about it. It's like, party girls who literally do fuck every guy. <laughs> like, you know, and they're known for that. And someone says, oh yeah, she's a bit of a tart, or something really, really, like, low down like that. You know, she's a bit loose or something, and they're like, you can't say that, and it's, like, low down on our priority list. And you're like, but, but she's literally, like, <laughs> or every night. <laughs> trying to find a new guy, you know. And, like, we see it as a joke. So, like, two South African guys I knew, a guy and a girl, actually. I knew one girl, she, one of them was a girl, the other was a gay guy. And the gay guy was always ripping into the girls for loads of shit. And this uh, girl was really, like, slight. She was, like, real bad. And he said to her in front of the Chinese stuff, Oh, whatever blows up your skirt, am I right? And he obviously meant it as like a catty like thing to say to her. And all of the girls were like, oh, you can't say that to her. And it's like, she's literally fucking a different guy every night. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, oh yeah, but you can't say it. It's like, yeah, but it's different with Westerners. Like, you know, they just see it as like, it doesn't, it's inconsequential if we fuck each other too much or something. Just don't get AIDS. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know why I'm talking about this, but like I always found that particularly quite interesting. Every culture has a different kind of primal, like a primary kind of fear, and some of it's like death. Some people, it's like other things, you know, like um, uh, like being called stupid. Uh, the concept of sex—they're quite blatant with sex and very like. Uh, 
not like sexually like provocative over here, but they're very well informed very early on. They just get told exactly what happens and they're like, oh. And it's just very kind of like pseudo maturely handled. They don't sit there and go, <laughs> like, you know, way into like middle school. <laughs> this is really, <laughs> they're, they're, they're really, they're just like, yes, this is something that will happen. <laughs> this is a bodily function. They're very like, kind of chill about it and they're just like oh well you know that's what happens people do that I want to do that <laughs> or whatever you know like very mature about it they just see it as like well you know that's happening so why the fuck do you care uh, <clears throat> yeah and like I think it's something to do with you could probably tie it to there's quite a lack of religion in some of these cultures like China and that so they're fear of death is a little higher because they see it more as a, yep, yeah, that's the end, you know? And it's like really just about this life now because places like China and other communist countries, they pretty much ban religion because religion is seen as a powerful alternative tool and could be used in a revolutionary sense because it's a huge gathering of people. So they don't like that because it's a huge gathering of people they can't control necessarily because they're there for other reasons like say God or Buddha or like something like that so they try and keep it down to a minimum that was only third I'm sad uh yeah damn it means I'll probably have to do it again at some point that Desmo Sudici is just so powerful I can't really get it to do the thing I want it to do and it keeps bucking everywhere if I didn't have like uh wheelie control option on it would just be flipping out every five seconds <clears throat> yeah so you know they're curse words like most things you'll see you, you know like things like this you're often seeing the culture's biggest fear being put at the top of the list of like you can't say that so i always find that quite interesting because you could go to another culture and then be like the worst thing is this but like uh it's just like a vague like measurement I just find it interesting because you'd think that it was just global but it's really not it's like very oh time attack oh it's the Sadichi again uh, came sick from this came 12 on this couldn't do this oh two champions to do Do a champion. Yeah, fuck it. Uh, do the ten ninety eight. Didn't I just do one like this, or did I just keep hovering over this one? The fuck, man. It was this one, wasn't it? And I did the ten forty eight. That's a DG, man. I just don't get on with it. So I'll do a 1098R. Yeah, anyway. Um, I can't remember how I got onto this topic. To go back to the original topic I had on the mind. Uh, yeah, like... Uh, oh yeah, I was talking about how a lot of generations prior to ours didn't question anything. And it's like... You know, it becomes really noticeable when you start questioning things. That things have just been going on for generation after generation. Because people are just like... You don't question your elders, just do the thing, even though it's illogical garbage. And you're like, well, why do we do this? Oh, because we've always done it this way. And it's like, well, it's a terrible way to do stuff, you know? Throw away the old. Tradition is just the trappings of, like, it's the memes from dead people, man. It's peer pressure from the dead. They don't matter. What they did back in their days... It's now history, and it should probably stay there, you know? Because some of it just doesn't make sense, or it's just ridiculously cruel by our standards of today, because we've learned a lot more compassion, so. Yeah, so anyway, talking about metal. <laughs> Started off on a weird turn there. Yeah, at first I was only really listening to glam rock and, like, stuff like that. Then I got into the Red Hot Chili Peppers in a great big way. I was obsessed. I was like, 
really obsessed for a long time. And it became like a big thing with me and everyone was like, dude, that guy is way too obsessed with the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And I was like, kind of what got me into playing guitar because I was like, oh, that's really cool, like sounding. Maybe I should learn the guitar. Then I got into Nirvana because, you know, it was around that age when every kid of my age was into Nirvana and then everyone was just getting out of Nirvana and was being like, oh, that shit's dumb and emo. Oh, you know, and all of that shit started coming in My Chemical Romance and shit. And then everyone was like, oh, yo, fucking like, any heavy music was apparently emo and you were totally going to kill yourself because you're listening to Slipknot. Slipknot an emo man, Aerosmith a heavy metal, and you were just like, who the fuck? You know, some of the kids in my school were just totally out of it, and you're just like, dude, that's just, you're straight up fucking wrong. <laughs> like, you know, I don't even know. Look at the genres that are on the fucking metadata and, like, what they have been since the dawn of time. So, like someone hears Dead Memories, because that came out during, like, secondary school, college for me. Uh, this uh, All Hope Is Gone album, and uh, everyone hears Dead Memories and Snuff, and they go, oh, they're emo now, and it's like, why, because they wrote two songs about their personal emotions. You know, that's what most musicians do at some point in their career, right? And everyone's calling everything else screamo for a while, and that really pissed me off too, because it's like, some guys was calling like bands like a tree you screamo and shit and I was like, uh, you know what, that's how I was introduced to them and I was like, oh okay. But like the big bands really that I was getting into that really helped gateway me into like heavier stuff. Not really bands that you would think like oh I'm just not doing well now. Like uh well some of them make sense. Kill switch engage. Uh, Mastodon, weird thing about Mastodon with me is I heard Blood and Thunder twice on the Need for Speed mo Most Wanted soundtrack, so I knew the band's name, but I hadn't really gone out of my way to buy them. And then I just saw Crack the Sky and was like, that's some sick album artwork. I'm just going to buy that and just love the album. And then I got a few more things on iTunes, like... Uh, you yeah, remember when you were actually allowed an iPod and allowed to own music and Apple didn't break everything? Yeah. So I had like Sleeping Giant and like things like that. And then I bought, someone bought me like the Blood and Thunder album. What's the Blood and Thunder album called? Was it just called Blood and Thunder? I don't remember. I don't think I can deal with this like, these bikes, man, because they're just... It's not that they're too fast, they just feel like they don't handle the way I want them to, you know? Which is probably because they're too fast, I don't really know. Just pulling out and bucking and I'm just like not getting it. Uh, yeah, so that was a good time. I really fell in love with songs like Iron Tusk, March of the Fire, Ant Fire Ants, Fire Ants. <laughs> That's a very different song. Um, uh, didn't really like much off of the Remission album, although I never really gave it a huge, as much chance as I, I had, uh, Crack the Sky on, like, repeat. Uh, so that was really good, I really enjoyed that. Uh, around that time, albums I had on repeat was that, Alice in Chains, Black Gives Way to Blue. Alice in Chains came out of nowhere for me, and they came out, like, I was listening to their new stuff. And I hadn't really ever listened to classic Alice in Chains until much later. And then obviously I picked up Dirt after a while and was like, this is really good. And it just became like, it just became basically that, you know, I picked up for like three quid out of a HMV and I was just like, this is really good. I like this. This is like classic Alice in Chains. <clears throat> it took me a while to get things like Jar of Flies and, um, the other stuff, but I had like a Greatest Hits compilation of some stuff. What's always weird is the Greatest Hits compilation never put Nutshell on anything, they always put No Excuses and uh, another one off of the Jar of Flies album. It's never Nutshell, which is one of my favorite tracks, which I came to very late and was like, holy shit, where's this been my whole life? Somehow got third, but it didn't go well. 
think I was the only one on the uh, 10, 1098 there. Everything else was the... See, they're all... <laughs> oh, God, they have a bike. Oh. Uh, this game just at some point narrows to the point of, like, drive the Desmo Sedici RR, and you're like, no, I don't want to, and it's like, do it, motherfucker! <laughs> like, <laughs> don't want to! I can't drive it, I can't be bothered to learn how to drive it. It's like, no, do it, do it, nerd, fucking do it. And you're like, oh. and like, how many of these races that are in the 2K era are drive the Desmo Sedici, or... S category being literally that or the 1098. Like, most of those are the, like that, aren't they? Oh yeah, I forgot this is a championship. This is going to go bad. <clears throat> so yeah, that. Kill switch engages, daylight dies, and then I did pick up End of Heartache, but I didn't really like it as much. It was still alright, but as daylight dies was big for me. Uh, a lot of my mates were into a Treyu, and I did borrow that album off of people. Listened to a bit of Papa Roach, but I only really liked the first album. And then I listened to Metamorphosis, because it came out around the time I started listening to them, and I was like, oh yeah, yeah it's alright, but like, they, they were always a bit too light for me. Even then, I was just like, this is like kind of like, just a bit like, you know, a bit lame, really. Never liked Medina Lake. All of my friends were like, oh, Medina Lake. I was like, oh, jeez. I went in and out. Like, there was a period of time when I was listening to My Chemical Romance. I bought Green Day's American Idiot. And I was like, this is a good song, good album. And then I just decided, fuck Green Day at some point. <laughs> I don't know why. I just went, oh, you know, yeah, like, they're all right. I have nothing to complain about Green Day. They're just really not my thing. And then everyone was pointing out that it's basically the man saying fuck the man at this point because they're so corporate. Uh, but, like, they didn't start off that way, apparently. Well, I don't really know. I was just never into the pop punk stuff. Never really got there either. I listened to Rise Against, though. Really like them. A lot of stuff actually came from playing Guitar Hero. Guitar Hero opened me up to a lot of stuff. I was already into Guns N' Roses, but, you know, I saw Guitar Hero 3 and I was like, Slash is on the box, I'm going to just play this. After complaining for years about Guitar Hero, I was like, nah, Guitar Hero sucks. It's just bullshit. It's not like it's a real guitar or anything. I was being really snobbish about it. Then I played it, it was like, cool. <laughs> I'm like this. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was kind of fun. I got into Van Halen at some point. I don't remember why or how. I, they just kind of seep into your consciousness after a while. The first time I listened to Pantera was Cemetery Gates on some illegal-ass pirate radio that I was streaming from my PSP. And it was like, it's it, you, you chose a genre, and it just streamed online radio to you. And the, the one I had it on all the time was Counterculture. And Counterculture just used to spin to different places and would be like, oh, these guys over in America are playing this at the moment. And uh, this song came on, and I was like, holy fucking shit, what is this? And they said afterwards, that was Cemetery Yates by Pantera. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> you know, first time. I was, lit, I was, it was like three in the morning, I was supposed to be asleep, and I had my headphones in, listening to this shit, lying in bed. And I just wrote in ballpoint pen on my arm so that I remember the next morning when I woke up, Pantera Cemetery Gates. <laughs> and it was half rubbed off in the morning and I was like, what the fuck is this? Oh yeah, that was sick. Uh, one of my mates got me into Metallica. Uh, I was really into Aerosmith at the time and was actually starting to turn into a bit of a hard rock snob. I was literally like, oh yeah, you know, I've kind of gone past listening to the heavy shit. I'll just listen to hard rock. That was the beginning of college. I was like, oh, Foo Fighters and Aerosmith and all of this stuff. And I was like, I'm just going to chill out again a bit more. Listen to the rock shit, you know, like Slash and like Velvet Revolver were there occasionally. And then at some point I was like, oh, you know what? I'm going to get back into metal. And this guy was like, you need to listen to Metallica. And then he bought me Rust in Peace. And then let me borrow Peace Sells, but who's buying? Uh... I, he bought me Ride the Lightning as well, and then I started buying Iron Maiden CDs just whenever they went on sale at um, 
and just picking up the entire back catalog and I got him Fear of the Dark on CD. He was like, oh, cool. And like, uh, yeah, we're really like liking that shit. Uh, Fear of the Dark was one of my favorite Maiden albums for a long time, but then I kind of just got a bit bored of it. Uh, my favorite album now, I was really in love for a past few years with Seventh Son. And then I just kind of like started listening to a load of live albums because it just made more sense. Peace of mind, of course. Did a listen to some, uh, Somewhere in Time quite a lot. Um, Number of the Beast is just goes without saying. And like, uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of Power Slave. Uh, I don't really like Two Minutes to Midnight, to be honest. I like the lyrics and when it starts going, I'm like, yeah, this is fucking sick. But the moment, I, like, if you say to me two minutes to midnight, I'm just like, eh. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with that song. Nothing wrong with the song. I actually like it when people play it. To be honest, there's not really an Iron Maiden song I don't like. Even like quite a lot of the Blaze Bailey stuff, like Lightning Strikes Twice and shit like that. But like, uh, it's just different, man. I like the, even the really classic stuff of Paul Diano. Um, like Sanctuary and Killers, um, Running Free, pretty sick. Um, yeah, that became a huge thing. One of my mates, Dads, who was a guitarist too, just gave me a data disc, which was the entire back catalog and a load of live rarities from both Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, and Bruce Dickinson's solo project. And that took me years to get through. And I listened to every album and most live albums that they ever released. And like some really weird rarities like Virus by Iron Maiden, which was released at this really weird point in the band's career and never released on anything but one like greatest hits comp and then just disappeared after that. Yeah, it came first. At some point, not many people I knew liked Motorhead, aside from the obvious, like, Ace of Spades over Kill kind of thing. And I was just like, oh, I'm just going to start buying Motorhead CDs. And I just bought Ace of Spades, Overkill, which is still one of my favorite albums, Iron Fist. What's the one with the bomber? Is that just called Bomber, or is it called something else? I've also bought something that's like uh, uh, Orgasmatron. Uh, never bought Eat the Rich in the end. I a load of their new shit. The new shit, uh, I really like The World Is Yours. I bought a special edition for that with the acoustic version of uh, Ace of Spades on it. And it's still to this day one of the best modern Motorhead albums that came out. Didn't really enjoy Aftershock, but I didn't really give it as much of a chance. And then the last one they released before Lemmy died, I ran through as well. And like... The World Is Yours caught me at a really specific time and stuff like Devils In My Head, Get Back In Line, um, Waiting For The Snake, those kind of tracks really just stuck with me and it's such a weird album for you to get stuck on out of all of Motorhead's career, um, all of it, and you pick that, <laughs> but like, I just liked it, I mean, I also liked the one before that which featured quite heavily in the uh, his bio biographical film the uh, it had teach you how to sing the blues and rock out with your cock out <laughs> which is obviously <laughs> when you when you're that age you're like that's <laughs> funny rock out with your cock out <laughs> it's like yeah, why is this track um, but you know it's Lemmy he just does whatever the fuck he wanted basically uh, Slash's solo album was a big hit with me. Deftones as well. Around the time I was listening to Black Gives Way to Blue and Crack the Sky, I picked up Deftones, White Pony, then also already had Saturday Night Wrist by then because I loved Holding the Earth. I was like, this is so trippy and weird and it's so different from a lot of shit I was listening to at the time. So I was like, oh, this is nice. And it's quite accessible, that song. And then I was listening to White Pony uh, and then uh, Diamond Eyes came out, and I really liked Diamond Eyes, but it just feels like around that time I would have liked anything Deftones put out. I, you know, then I listened to Koi no Yokan, and I didn't really like it as much, and I didn't give it as much chance. It just felt less characterized for me. 
and I listened to gore and really enjoyed gore. So it's like, I mean, my opinion is really strange on this shit because it's in a total vacuum. All of my mates were listening to, they were like, yeah, I'm metal. I listened to Papa Roach and Good Charlotte, and you were like, okay, some 41, man, and you me at six, and you're like, don't want to be a dick, but all of that is kind of pop punk. Not that that's bad, it's just, oh, I listen to the heavy fucking metal, and it's like, who's Metallica, and you're like, how are you alive? <laughs> like, you know, I don't understand. Um, yeah, Mean was sick. Saw them live at Twickenham during the, uh, what later went on to be the Flight 666 documentary. That was around that time that they were doing that shit. Saw them and Within Temptation and Avenged Sevenfold were supporting. And some band that was like, oh, I want to say it's Steve Harris's daughter's band and she just swore her tits off and had bottles thrown at her. <laughs> I was like, okay. Everyone was like, yeah, she got this just because, and then she did got bot booed off stage. It was kind of embarrassing. Uh, Avenged Sevenfold played a lazy every time. What turned me off of Avenged Sevenfold? I like their self-titled. I like City of Evil. I pretty much gave up on them after that because they were the laziest people I saw alive. Sinister Gates came on stage with sunglasses on, hung over to shit chewing gum every time it was one of his lines to sing he would just ignore the mic he was just walking around like i don't give a fuck he was putting hardly any effort in it felt like it was pre-taped and he was just miming and like m shadows is there trying to get the crowd hyped up he's like yeah come on man because he's trying to be a good frontman and he's like yeah you ready to scream before they play scream and like since he gets there just like yeah i fucking guess i'm too cool for this and uh, this was a guy who was originally purported to be the modern era Slash in some guitar magazines. And I was like, this guy's a cunt. <laughs> yeah. And like, um, I don't know, that really rubbed off on, on me in the wrong way. Because I was sat with guys who were like Avenged Sevenfold haters. And they were like, you like this band? And I'm like, starting to think I don't. You know, and that shit does affect your opinion, especially when you go all the way out, spend all that money on a download ticket, and then he comes up, and it's like thousands of pounds to get to download nowadays, and he's just sat there like, yeah, I, I don't need to take this seriously, and like, the difference between energy between that and being at the front for Mastodon, and they're all hungover because it's the middle of the morning on the final day, and they're just playing Iron Tusk like fucking crazy, they're tuning guitars mid, mid uh, thing, and they're just screaming, it's time for Iron Tusk! And everyone's just going nuts. And you can tell uh, several, of, uh, several of both guitarists, I think, and the drummer were hung over to shit. But they just did it because of the pure fucking love. In comparison to what, like, you know, you can tell the poser bands straight away, like, and, you know, when they're live, and some bands really don't fare well live. I saw Black Tide, and I was like, oh my fucking god, what's happening here? Um, some, and there was a lot of, like, the reason I stopped going to download was it happened way before I left China, for China. It's expensive, and, um... <clears throat> is expensive, and they had more sound engineering faults on regular than Sonosphere did, which was cheaper. And it was like, I watched Deftones live, and an entire, like, monitor set with the screen just switched off for, like, two whole songs, and no one went to fix it. The sound crapped out in, uh, was it The Cult when I saw them there, or was it The Cult at Sonosphere? and it crapped out for a whole song. Billy Idol went out into a mild drizzle with the mic, and halfway through Rebel Yell, it just switched off for the rest of the song, and they were like, oh. <laughs> it felt like the sound engineers weren't being paid. It felt like they were just like, oh, fuck this. You know, and it just like, I'm paying this much, and you're not even getting real sound engineers. Or the sound engineers are not getting paid enough. All those two <laughs> for like six stages, or whatever the fuck they run now. And you're like, this is bad, like, you know, and like, you see such passion in some musicians' lives, like, Five Finger Death Punch, 
everyone gives them shit, but when you all, I watched them, I picked up War is the Answer because Metal Hammer wouldn't shut the fuck up about War is the Answer around that period of time and uh, Ivan Moody. It was that or Ronnie James Dio Memorial stuff. That was all it was around that period of uh, that year when all that went down. And I used to make jokes about, I'm surprised they haven't done a thing saying Ivan Moody's opi opinion on uh, Ronnie James Dio because that seems to be the two things they talk about along with the occasional Opeth. <laughs> and like, um, that was that period. And the Porcupine Tree and stuff came out with, uh, that was a great album as well, uh, The Incident. I really like that. I saw them live as well. Uh, probably the same time. Ivan Moody was fucking passionate when we were playing War is the Answer. You could tell it meant a lot to him and Zoltan and the other guys. Like, you could tell that they really gave a shit. I, don't, I, I saw him again a few times after that and I still felt like there was a lot of passion behind it, but it was like they were playing and they were like, right, we're just going to keep playing. I want to play another song. So we're going to play Hard to See and they, or like Bulletproof or something. And they just carried on playing. And the guys, they, he would just call out to the audience and say, guys are saying I need to get off the stage. I ain't going to get off the fucking stage. We're going to start right here. And he's doing the whole like proper trying to get the crowd riled up. And like they switch them off mid set. And he just, like, they carry on playing as if it didn't happen for the rest of the track. Then they go afterwards, you guys are fucking amazing. And you're just like, and then you've got Medina Lake coming on stage just going, ugh. <laughs> and you just got, like, you know, a lot of these guys, like, you know, credit where it's due. I walk by all time low. I'm not a fan of all time low. They were fucking giving it socks. <laughs> like, they were... They were pounding. They were just going nuts. And like, they were just going, yeah, and they were just going absolutely hype. And you love to see that shit. And uh, you just did not see that shit with um, Avenged Sevenfold when I saw them. Or really, I think Bullet for My Valentine did a better show. But like, to be honest, when I went and saw them, I was with a guy who fucking hated Bullet. Uh, it was around the Screaming Fire era, uh, that was at Download 2, and it was okay. It was fine, <laughs> you know? It was fine. Like, uh, <clears throat> I'd say they were pretty good, uh, but like, he was having trouble getting the crowd uh, hyped, it was a bit like awkward. And then after that, I was just like, well, I'm not going to go see him again, because I kind of casually listened to Scream Aim Fire. I really liked Hand of Blood, but for whatever reason, I never got huge into Bullet. Even though there's nothing wrong with them, I actually think they're pretty good. I really like Heart Bursts Into Fire and Tears Don't Fall, and, uh, you know, like all of that stuff. Especially the Tears Don't Fall, where they actually scream on it a lot more. Uh, they don't tone it down for, like... Trivium were good pretty much every time I saw Trivium live. They have got a great standard. Uh, I really enjoy them. I've seen them three times. One time supporting Maiden at the O2 because I've seen Iron Maiden like five times because I'm a fucking lunatic fan. Great thing about Iron Maiden, their tickets are always affordable. Way more affordable than, say, Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi is like £90 standing, <laughs> like in the UK. And then, like, the equivalent in... Um, uh, like, you know, Iron Maiden live at the O2 is like £35. <laughs> like, the fuck? And that's seated. <laughs> you know, like, what the hell? Because they always make sure that they're affordable to, like, the working classes, because that's the, kind of their roots. And it's pretty sick. I uh, saw ACDC live at the O2 as well during the Black Ice tour. I'm very fortunate. I saw Queens of Stone Age during the Era of Ogaris uh, tour kind of period. Um, Dragon Force with Teresa supporting around the time of uh, Ultra Beatdown just came out because I got the t-shirt and it was the Ultra Beatdown artwork. Uh, so I think it was still uh, the old singer, the uh, ZP3 guy. Uh, around that time, that was good. Uh, Teresa's were pretty good, but boy did they disappear after a while. They were like, yeah, we're Viking metal, we're really big into Viking metal, and all of that, like, kind of style, and they were doing all of the war paint and the furs and all that shit. 
and then suddenly they just disappeared, didn't they? And Tarasus just were no more. And then suddenly it was Ale Storm and Eamon the Marth instead. And I was just like, well, you know what? I prefer Eamon the Marth. I don't want to be a dick. Uh, no offense to Tarasus. I saw them twice. No, three times. Saw uh, Delane. Delane are all right live, but like they kind of came and went. Saw Mars Volt alive and was disappointed actually, because the sound again was subpar because they were put on the second stage of Sonosphere and that year the sound was not great on that stage. They fucked up Fear Factory as well. They fucked up all of their, you know, they have all of those voice filters and all of the samples for stuff like Final Exit because it was that. It was Mechanized, yeah, it was the Mechanized album, and I was just like, this is, this should be sick, and me and my mate uh, were real big Fear Factory fans, and every, the other guys in the group were like, oh, I don't give a fuck about Fear Factory on Mastodon, we're just going to go off and get drunk, and I was like, oh, okay. And I was a little disappointed that they fucked up, like, they were trying to do well as well. Um, oh, who else... Seen a lot of bands, but like I was saying, uh, well, you know, ooh, there we go. Saw Skindred like eight times because my family and my friends got obsessed with Skindred. It was like my mate Seb came up to me in like college or something and said, "There's this band, man, called Skindred." I was listening to the lead track, Nobody. It's pretty good, but I'm not sure about their other tracks. I haven't bothered listening to them yet. I was like, oh, okay. And then Shark Bites and Dog Fights came out, and he was like, hey, do you want to go see that band I was talking about, Skinner? I was like, fuck it, man. I'll just go to anything. <laughs> like, uh... And I was just like... And they were there, I think, the first time I saw them. Who was the support? Did I see them at Portsmouth or Southampton? One of the first times I saw them, Carnival with the support, and I fucking loved it. I was like, Carnival is sick. And then they kind of just... I don't know, what the fuck happened to Carnival? They came to Sonosphere, and I was like, dudes, you've got to check out Carnival. Carnival is sick. They played a fairly meager set at, like, the first slot in the day, and all of my mates were like, what the fuck is this? Uh, it's the same with Mars Volta, where I was like, you gotta see Mars Volta, man, they're Prague, they got really cool artwork, oh, like, man, like, La Via, La Via Square, or whatever, <laughs> fucking speak, was so sick, and then I watched them, and, like, we were all sat there, like, and he was like, why is he singing like a cat? <laughs> like, what? And he's like, this is fucking dumb, and then they were like, we're gonna go get a burger, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> You hate it when you introduce a guy to a band and it, you, all your mates are just like, and they put on a really bad show or they're just not a very good performance that day. And they're like, you suck. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> it's not that bad. Anyway, I'm just going to have a break now.